Okay, welcome to our Compute in Microsoft Azure Stack session today. My name is Heiko Ulrichs and I'm a senior consultant with Microsoft Services and here today to show you what Compute in Microsoft Azure Stack means and how it looks like. So first of all, our today's agenda, we start with a quick overview about infrastructure as a service in general, the solution overview and ARM, our Azure Resource Manager, followed by Azure Stack Compute, a bit more details about compute, virtual machines, gaps between Azure and Azure Stack, managed disks and fault domains. The next topic is operator scenarios covering infrastructure VMs, quotas, and extensions. And the last topic is compute controller. So let's start with, a, with an overview. So first of all, Azure Stack Infrastructure Service, why should I care? First of all, what does infrastructure as a service mean? So for us, um, infrastructure as a service contains virtual machines, disks, network interface cards, networks, but also um, things like VPN gateways, load balancers, and other things that are covered in our networking module in more detail. And of course, virtual machines or infrastructure as a service are the first step. So more or less all services in Azure Stack are implemented as virtual machines under the covers. And for most of our customers, infrastructure as a service is the first thing they try, they do, and they want to use in Azure as well as in Azure Stack. And besides that, more or less almost every application today requires infrastructure as a service infrastructure. So when you think of classic applications, um, in most cases, they require some kind of middleware, SQL server, exchange server, whatever you can think of as a backend. And as of today, most of these services require a virtual machine. And um, also an important topic for you as an Azure Stack operator, all platform as a service services, all PaaS services are today built of infrastructure as a service. So when you think of SQL Server, Service Fabric, Notification Hubs, Web Apps, all these things are built on top of infrastructure as a service. So how does the solution itself look like today? Starting from the top to the bottom. So the top box, our guest workload resources are infrastructure as a service and platform as a service services like virtual machine. Doesn't matter if it's Linux or Windows, we have storage services like our blobs, queues, tables, we have virtual networks, but we have also websites using .NET, PHP, Python, or service fabric clusters. And all these things are available through our end user experience. So either through the portal, through developer tools like Visual Studio, or using PowerShell or directly communicating with our ARM REST APIs. And all these things are clients for our Azure Resource Manager. So Azure Resource Manager is some kind of an abstraction layer that offers a broad set of APIs to clients like the portal, like PowerShell, like um, other libraries for a broad set of languages. And below Azure Resource Manager, which is exactly the same interface as um, we have in Azure, we have our extensible service framework. This extensible service framework offers core services like identity, subscriptions, role-based access control, metrics, usage, and other things, but also additional services 
optional resource providers like our app service, like SQL, MySQL adapter, but also um, other resource providers that might show up in the future, like IoT Hub, like Event Hubs, and other things that are not available today, but might be available in the future. And these additional services are not available out of the box. They come as optional additional resource providers that you can install on your own and on demand. So you're not wasting resources for resource providers that of course have their own infrastructure that you don't need in your environment. And all these services are built on our foundational services like compute, storage, networking, and key vault. And the bottom box, cloud infrastructure, is responsible for infrastructure management. So infrastructure management contains things like compute, storage, networking, and that's in the end the translation of Azure, Azure Stack, into the underlying components, like for example today Hyper-V. Here you can see the space where we can plug in additional services. Okay, let's have a look on ARM and resource providers. So first of all, ARM means Azure Resource Manager, and that's our central entry point. It provides an Azure consistent management across public and private cloud infrastructures. Means the ARM layer is exactly the same, doesn't matter if you're working with Azure, with Azure Stack, or with our southern clouds like the German Azure or Azure China. And clients can use REST, PowerShell, CLI, other implementations in their favorite language like Python or the portal. And resource providers are responsible to manage a specific type of infrastructure. So for every use case, there are different resource providers. Like for example, foundational services like Compute are implemented using the Compute Resource Provider, CRP. Network services like IP addresses, load balancers, VNets, VPN gateways are implemented by our network resource provider, NRP. And storage services like blobs, queues, tables are implemented by the storage resource provider, SRP. And these are only a few examples. ARM also allows us to work with templates and templates um, allow us to declare a specific desired state and ARM also allows us to build templates and run them on different platforms and environments which on one hand allows us to develop something for example in Azure before we deploy it to Azure Stack or we can test it and deploy it on one Azure Stack before we deploy it to another one so it gives us a lot of flexibility Here you can see an example. We can use the same templates from the same gallery, for example, to deploy something to Azure and to Azure Stack. So the ARM layer is consistent. Here are a few examples. So you don't have to start from scratch. You can go to GitHub into our Azure Stack Quick Start Templates repository and you will find a broad set of examples, for example, for SQL Server, SharePoint, remote desktop services, and a lot more that you can use as an example, as a foundation, to build your own Azure Resource Manager templates for very, sim very simple deployments, like, for example, deploying a virtual machine, or to deploy um, way more complex things like a fully fledged exchange farm or a remote desktop services farm. And to get a better understanding of how such an ARM template looks like and what the various resource providers provide, here's an example of a virtual machine. And starting on the left side, you can see 
that we have our resource group, the outer blue box, and our resource group contains different services. So for example, we have our virtual machine. Our virtual machine defines a hardware profile, an OS profile, storage, network, and all these virtual machine related things. But it also contains a network interface. It might contain a public IP address, a storage account, and other network related details, like for example, in which address space we want to deploy our virtual machine. In which into which subnet and which address prefix it should use. And this is a very basic example. Um, you can think of a lot more things you can add here. And this is just one example um, out of our Azure Stack Quick Start Templates repository. So let's dig a bit deeper into Azure Stack Compute. So first of all, um, when you have already some experience with Azure, all these services should look very familiar. So Azure Stack offers a subset of exactly what's available in Azure today. So you might already know our VM SKU sizes like standard DV2, for example. This is a VM size that's also available in Azure Stack. And in Azure Stack, we offer about 80% of the most common VM sizes that are available in Azure today. Of course, not everything is available in Azure Stack today. So think of examples like VM SKUs with GPU capability. They will, of course, require GPU capabilities in your local Azure Stack first. So without GPU capable hardware, for your Azure Stack, you will never see GPU-capable VMs in your Azure Stack. And next to virtual machines, we also have virtual machine scale sets in Azure Stack, but with a slightly limited set of functionality. So for example, today we have no insights-based autoscale, and this is one of the gaps in our compute resource provider today. Regarding the compute performance in Azure Stack, this is close to the performance in Azure. So the emulation in Azure Stack today is imperfect and is really focused on uniform in-guest quantities. So for example, RAM CPU disk size quantities are aligned to Azure, but the CPU performance might be better than it is in Azure for low load environments or on the other hand storage performance is likely likely to be significant better than in azure but this really depends on the utilization of your environment and might be not true for every single kpi so how does the implementation look like when we now talk about compute api gaps. How should I as an operator, how should I as a developer make sure that my application works in Azure or that my application that I've developed and tested in Azure will also work in my Azure stack? And to make sure that this works, we have so-called API versions. So our resource provider offers different services, like for example, you can see on the right side, the Microsoft Compute Provider offers us availability sets, but it also offers us, for example, virtual machines, virtual machine extensions, and all these things. And behind every uh, resource, be behind every service that a compute resource provider offers, you can see an API version. And the API version might be different from what's available in Azure today. So a newer API version marks a newer functionality, a newer feature set, and this is a differentiator. But there should be always an API version that's available on Azure as well as on Azure Stack. And as a developer who develops something for Azure Stack, you should make sure that you choose an API version 
that's available in all environments you are developing for. So for example, um, from a compute API perspective, we have only a subset of API versions. We have no encrypted disk support. We have also no auto scale support today, and we have no host based diagnostics except VM CPU percentage. These are the differences. These are related to the API version, and these things might change in the future. At the bottom, you'll see a PowerShell example how you can retrieve the API versions, in this case for the Microsoft Compute Resource Provider within your environment. A few more examples about VM lifecycle gaps. So redeploy VMs, which means restarting or booting a VM on a different host is only possible on multi-node system. So it's not available in the ASDK today which makes sense because the ASDK only contains a single node. Another limitation is that we have guest diagnostics only in Windows machines and disks are fixed size. So you cannot exceed the total amount of storage in your system. So no over commitment. The virtual machine extensions are another pretty cool feature in Azure Infrastructure as a Service, and they allow us to configure things within our machines. So for example, using the Windows Defender extension, we can configure the Windows Defender within our VM during deployment time or afterwards. Other examples are the SQL Infrastructure as a Service agent, which allows us to configure a SQL Server within a VM deployment. As of today, Azure Stack supports a subset of virtual machine extensions and versions, but this will change over time and we'll see more and more virtual machine extensions that are available in Azure today coming available or getting available on Azure Stack. And this is the cloud administrator's job, so the cloud administrator can download them and make them available for the Azure Stack user. When you now want to deploy VMs on Azure Stack, this is exactly the same experience as it is in Azure. So you can, for example, use your our GitHub Azure Stack Wixar templates to deploy workloads. You can also leverage the PowerShell, Visual Studio, or of course, the Azure tenant or administrator portal. Next topic is managed disks. So when we started with Azure and Azure Stack, we started with storage accounts. And some of you might have seen that so storage accounts are still available. And in the past, VM disks were, uh, was only possible to store VM disks in a storage account. And due to the fact that storage accounts have some limitations, and you'll learn more about these limitations or challenges or things you have to consider in our storage module, there was some kind of complexity to manage and maintain these storage accounts and handle and deal with their limitations. Managed disks is an abstraction for this. So managed disks will do the will remove the complexity or will hide the complexity that you as an Azure Stack end user operator um, don't have to deal with the corresponding storage account that's used in the backend. And this guarantees us, on one hand, a better performance due to the fact that Azure Stack handles storage account limits for you, but it also allows us granular access control. So due to the fact that a managed disk is a top-level Azure Resource Manager resource, we can now apply Azure role-based access control, we can apply logs and tags on a per disk level. Another positive side effect is that we are now smarter about availability sets. So we can use different fault domains and store disks in different storage clusters. And besides that, we have an easier migration from standard to premium, at least in Azure. So Azure premium storage is not available in Azure Stack today, only for consistency. But when it comes 
when it gets available, um, it provides us a minimal downtime for background migrations. When you want to learn more, check the link below with the differences and considerations for Azure Stack Managed Disks. Okay, besides the managed disks or the decision between storage accounts and managed disks, we have in nearly all of our VM SKUs a temporary disk. The difference between the attached data disks and the OS disk and the temporary disk is that the temporary disk lays on the same node as the Azure VM. And it's in a Windows VM, for example, always attached as drive D and can be used, for example, for SQL, TempDBs or other high performance workloads or storage workloads that do not require persistent storage. Because, for example, when you reboot the VM and it gets started on a different node, the temp disk might get wiped. So potential workloads for the temporary disk are page files, for example, in Windows VMs, or SQL tempdbs. And also, this is something we'll discuss in more detail in our storage module. We have some gaps between storage in Azure and in Azure Stack today. And this, these gaps will yeah, get smaller over time by releasing newer API versions. And what you can see on the right side is um, something from our public roadmap. We can see that we, for example, here released a newer storage API version. And this, will, this is something that will happen um, several times in the future that we release a newer API version. As of today, not all API versions that are available in Azure are also available in Azure Stack. We have today no support for Azure Files, which is our managed SMB managed files service. And we have also no premium storage. What does it mean? As of today, we you can select premium storage, but it's only for API consistency. There's no SLA, there's no different storage in the back end. These disks will end up on the same storage that's in that's available in your Azure Stack. The only difference are the IOP rate caps you will find in the VM SKU list in our documentation. Next topic is fault domains. So here's an example where every host is colored to match a fault domain for a particular availability set. So in this example, we have four nodes and these four nodes can handle an availability set with three fault domains. What we can see here is we have fault domain one, we have fault domain two, we have fault domain three. And the reason why we cannot have four fault domains here is that in a four node system, the fourth node is our reserve node. We need, for example, for patch and update, FRU or other operations. Here's another example. So the blue boxes are an availability set with three VMs with a spread of three. Means that when you deploy three VMs into this availability set, these VMs will end up on three different nodes in our stack. When we deploy a different availability set, for example, four VMs with a spread of two, means that here you can see these VMs, they are only spread across two nodes. So availability sets are a good way um, to implement affinity rules to make sure, for example, when you have two domain controllers, that they are not running on the same physical node. And here's an example of how to implement it in an ARM template. What you can see is that we deploy a resource type is, first of all, here is our resource provider, Microsoft Compute, and the service is an availability set. 
And what we do here is we configure a fault domain count of three. On the other side, you can see five, and this is red because you cannot configure more fault domains than are available. Like in our previous example, in a four node Azure stack, you can only configure a, f a maximum of three fault domains. Now, a bit more about operator scenario. So I mentioned it in the beginning that in Azure Stack, all the infrastructure services are also implemented using virtual machines under the covers. And as an Azure Stack operator with access to the Azure Stack administrator portal, you are able to do some kind of monitoring and troubleshooting and operations to your infrastructure VMs. So for example, the portal is implemented as an infrastructure VM or DNS, the integrated active directory and other services. And as an operator, you can see all these infrastructure roles here, for example, you can see if there are any critical or warning alerts. And here you can see the instances. So in the Azure Stack development kit, every service is using only a single machine. In a multi-node system, most services have at least three instances to make sure that an outage um, never affects the whole system, that everything is implemented in a redundant way. And when you select one of these instances, you can also start or restart these infrastructure roles. But this is in most cases something you will do together with a Microsoft support as part of a support case, for example. Okay, another operator task is capacity management. And this is one of the tasks that is done in Azure by Microsoft operators. In Azure Stack, that's something that you as an Azure Stack operator has to do. So, for example, to make sure that not a single user, not a single customer of your Azure Stack can consume all available services, you can configure quotas. And that's something we'll explain in detail in our Offers, Plans and Quotas module. Just to give you an example here of our compute resource provider. So in most cases, you configure quotas for a specific resource provider. In this example, it's compute. And you can see here, we can configure a maximum number of virtual machines, for example. But we can also configure a maximum number of virtual machine cores, availability sets, virtual machine scale sets, the maximum amount of managed disks or premium managed disk, for example. When you want to add additional capacity to your stack, this can only be done by adding an additional node to your Azure Stack. And as you've heard in one of the previous modules, Azure Stack today can scale between four and 60 nodes. So you can start with four nodes and you can incrementally add additional nodes up to 60 nodes in a single scale unit. Another important detail here is that the core count is not factored against capacity and that we'll do in integrated monitoring here and we'll provide warnings and critical alerts in Azure Stack, which can be seen on one hand in the Azure Stack admin portal, as well as through REST APIs when you, for example, um, do Azure Stack monitoring using SCOM, NetGeos, or another solution that's consuming Azure Stack's integrated monitoring data. Third-party workloads are more or less things you've downloaded from the Azure Stack Marketplace or from the Azure Marketplace because the Azure Stack Marketplace is, is more or less exactly the Azure Marketplace but with some limitation. So the ISVs can select if their solution is available for Azure or for Azure Stack or for both. Another way to provide solutions is as an Azure Stack operator, you can upload your own images and can provide them in the Azure Stack Marketplace. 
Important to know here is that you your images um, need the Windows Azure agent or on Linux Windows Linux agent. This agent is used to communicate with the VM that allows Azure Stack to gather, for example, performance data or to boot, reboot the machine, reset passwords, and so on. Last topic of our compute module is the compute control. And here you can see some internals. So this is a high-level architecture diagram of our Azure Stack Compute Resource Provider. And we can see here on the top layer, we have our Azure Resource Manager. This is our entry point for everything. And below our Azure Resource Manager, you can see two boxes. So on one hand, we have the classic tenant workload providing compute resources for the admin space as well as for the tenant space. And here on the right side, the red box is the admin part. Again, compute resources and admin resources. So the difference here is on the left side, you can provide virtual machines and extensions. On the right side, you can configure quotas, you can add images and so on. And these compute resource providers under the covers leverage a set of compute microservices. So our compute resource provider, for example, uses the blob manager, manifest provider, ISO manager, network manager, and interacts with other resource providers, like for example, storage and network, because a VM um, can't get deployed without the corresponding storage and network. And under the covers, all of these microservices compute of, of the compute resource provider communicate with the compute controller. And the compute controller consists of things like the topology manager, cluster manager, and so on. And these services translate the commands into commands for the underlying components, like, for example, failable cluster manager, Hyper-V, storage space direct and all these things we are using today to implement all these services. Here's for example an example of how to create a virtual machine and what's used and triggered during the process. What you can see on the left side is a creation pipeline starting with a tenant that's requesting a virtual machine and again it doesn't matter if it's through the portal, PowerShell, um, all of these things are handled by our Azure Resource Manager. So um, let, let's consider that the user is creating a VM using the portal. means that we start from here. The user is entering the required information into the portal. The portal is in the background creating an ARM template. And the ARM template is sent through the template validation to make sure that the template, the ARM template that's used in the background is consistent and valid. The next step is now to create a VM placeholder. And this is the first step that happens under the covers. Next step is now to let the compute resource provider select a cluster and a host. And this is the job done by the compute controller. Next step is acquire a page blob. So we need a page blob to store our OS disk in. This is a job for the storage resource provider. And we create a network interface card. This is handled by the network resource provider. Then we register this VM for usage. This allows an Azure Stack Administrator to track consumption. And the last step is now to start and customize the virtual machine. This is the whole process of a tenant who's requesting a new virtual machine. A few more details around the extensions. So I mentioned it a bit earlier. You, we have a set of extensions that allow us to configure services within the VM from the outside, for example, during the deployment. Like I, I gave you a few examples like um, BG Info, Windows Defender, and some third party tools. And the process is more or less the same. So the VM, the process will check the VM extension repository, then it will request an extension from the extension manager. And at the end of the day, the tenant VM using the guest agent, that's what you can see here, will talk to the host plugin, which talks to the guest metadata service 
to configure something within the VM. And this is something you can combine. So for example, you can build your own image without creating a ton of golden images, which are hard to manage. You can configure an ARM template. You can build an ARM template that contains on one hand infrastructure, the image versions, for example, if it contains a Windows server or Linux, and combined with a set of VM extensions to configure all the other things within the VM, starting with VM access, things like Docker, custom script extensions to execute your own scripts, or for example, desired state configuration to after successfully creating the VM, configuring something within it. Last but not least, um, a more detailed architectural overview, architecture overview, sorry, where you can see again exactly the same story. We have two different clients here. We have our Azure portal, we have templates, PowerShell, CLI, and all the other services. And both of them use the Azure Resource Manager as an abstraction layer. And all requests go through the Azure Resource Manager, which then uses a broad set of resource providers. A few of them were already introduced, like for example, the Compute Resource Provider here, Network Resource Provider, Storage Resource Provider, and all the other things. And at the bottom, you can see the hardware layer, which is implemented using switches, compute, storage, and all the physical underlying services. And this is up to a certain degree, exactly the same in Azure. So the translation, here is another example. We can see here at the top, the compute resource provider. When you remember, triggered by something you've, um, where you used ARM, for example, executed an ARM template, it uses a compute resource provider. The compute resource provider uses the compute controller, which is the underlying microservice, and the compute controller translates these commands into Hyper-V or failover clustering. So last topic, cluster server compute lifecycle. So a few important things. Within a scale unit, which is more or less a cluster in Azure Stack, the scale unit itself and its nodes are registered against the compute controller during the deployment. The compute controller executes the drain of nodes for field replacement. So for example, when you have to replace a node due to an outage or whatever, um, this is a task that is triggered through the compute controller. So you, as an Azure Stack operator, you can go to the admin portal and you can drain a node um, to, for example, power it off, to replace it, and then you can add it back to your cluster and it gets registered against the compute controller again. And the compute controller makes sure that it gets the correct versions, the correct services, and so on. The compute controller also orchestrates the power cycle of scale nodes scale unit nodes. And the VM clustering gives high availability. The movement of VM maintains high availability even during server down conditions like patch and update cycles. What does that mean? So the compute controller takes care of rebooting nodes and making sure of migrating and moving VMs before it powers off one of the nodes. For example, during patch and update. And that's it for the compute module. Thank you very much for your time.